Built like a tank, but agile as a falcon, the twin-engine Bristol Bowfighter was full of contradictions, earning it a reputation that left enemies puzzled and allies grateful. On June 12, 1942, the Bowfighter, piloted by Ken Gatward, skimmed dangerously low over the English Channel, aiming for the very heart of Nazi-occupied Paris. At such low altitudes, the threat of anti-aircraft fire increased by the minute as he approached the continent. The iconic Arc de Triomphe loomed ahead, and the aircraft released its unexpected cargo, a French tricolore. The flag fluttered to the ground, a daring message of allied audacity and hope planted in the heart of Nazi-occupied France. Pivoting sharply, the Bowfighter set its sights on its next target, the Gestapo headquarters at the Place de la Concorde. Guns blazing, the bow unleashed havoc rattling the enemy's nerve center. Whatever the mission, the Bristol Bowfighter was always up for the challenge. Before World War II, many nations prioritized single-engine fighters designed for day-intercept missions. These agile, lightweight aircraft were well-suited for quick operations, but fell short in range and firepower, limiting their utility in prolonged or specialized operations. However, one exception to this rule was Germany. Equipped with long-range heavy fighters, such as the Messerschmitt Bf 110, the Third Reich's Air Force could execute various roles, from escort missions to ground attacks, thanks to extended flight ranges and heavier armaments. As hostilities in Europe loomed, the Royal Air Force recognized a pressing need for a new twin-engine fighter. While the RAF's mainstays, the Hurricane and Spitfire, were excellent in their roles, they lacked the range and payload to adequately counter growing threats from German bombers and naval forces. The UK's glaring aerial arsenal deficiency prompted action. In late 1938, Bristol's design team, led by Leslie Fries, privately initiated a project based on their latest achievement, the Beaufort, a general reconnaissance and torpedo bomber. After a thorough evaluation, the team found the Beaufort structurally robust, particularly in its wings, nacelles, undercarriage, and tail. They concluded that these features were promising for further development to enhance speed and agility. With this in mind, the team embarked on crafting the ultimate Allied long-range aircraft. In just over six months, the team presented the Royal Air Force with the first prototype Bristol Bowfighter. Bristol engineers repurposed the Beaufort airframe to create the Bowfighter prototype, saving time and resources. They modified the design under the guidance of lead designers Fries and Roy Fatten, who narrowed the fuselage, added a single-seat cockpit, and designated a dorsal spot for a navigator and observer. Recognizing the aircraft's potential, the Royal Air Force's Air Ministry swiftly approved an initial contract for 300 Bowfighters. This expedited approval occurred two weeks before the aircraft's first test flight, reflecting the urgency of the UK's extensive rearmament program. The Bowfighter prototype flew for the first time on July 17, 1939, under the command of Captain Ewens, a few short weeks before Germany invaded Poland and ignited World War II. Soon after the outbreak of hostilities, the Royal Air Force increased its orders substantially, even placing one for an astonishing 918 units shortly after receiving the first batch of production models. During a visit to Bristol's Filton facility in 1940, Lord Beaverbrook, the Minister of Aircraft Production, took the opportunity to highlight the Bowfighter's crucial importance to the war effort. He strongly encouraged its rapid integration into the Royal Air Force's operational lineup. By fighter standards, the Bowfighter, Equipped with powerful but relatively quiet Hercules engines, was somewhat heavy and slow, weighing 16,000 pounds and barely reaching a maximum speed of 335 miles per hour. Though its considerable size initially sparked doubt, the Bristol Bowfighter would quickly prove invaluable. The Bristol Bowfighter entered service in July 1940, a year after the war started, at a critical juncture for the RAF. As Luftwaffe tactics shifted to nighttime bombing during the Battle of Britain, the RAF turned to the Bowfighter for its nocturnal operations. Coinciding with the advent of British airborne interception radar sets, the Bowfighter was a game-changer. Its nose cone housed a Mark IV radar connected to an observer's scope. At night, this setup enabled the aircraft to spot enemy planes while intercom guidance led the pilot to the target. Though also radar-equipped, the simultaneously used Bristol Blenheim IF couldn't match the Bowfighter's speed and firepower, which could make quick work of German BF-110 night bombers with a short burst from its four 20mm Hispano cannons. The pairing of radar and the Bowfighter proved incredibly effective in night combat. The aircraft was also fast enough to catch and inflict severe damage on German bombers. The RAF's No. 219 Squadron earned the Bowfighter's first aerial win 
by taking down a Dornier DO-17Z on October 25, 1940. The first radar-aided victory came against a Junkers Ju-88 on November 19, 1940. In just six months, bow fighters, guided by their sensitive radars, had eliminated more than a dozen Nazi aircraft. By then, the Battle of Britain was over, and more advanced radar systems were being rolled out. Air Marshal W. Sholto Douglas underscored its impact in April 1941. Bow fighters, comprising just 21% of night sorties, were responsible for over 65% of enemy aircraft destruction. This compelling track record caused Douglas to push for a substantial increase in bow fighter numbers. In addition to its role as a night fighter, the bow fighter was one of World War II's first multi-role aircraft. Its strong airframe allowed adaptability to various weapons and mission profiles, even in challenging weather. The model became one of the first land-based torpedo aircraft of the war, and was also an essential asset in the RAF's coastal command for the entirety of the conflict. Especially crucial during the peak German U-boat activity, the bow, armed with torpedoes and heavy guns, was effective against both U-boats and surface ships, and undertook long-range reconnaissance, providing valuable information to the Allies. Its versatility made it invaluable for long-range missions to strike enemy bases and shipping, even reaching Norway. Despite its size, which some believed to be clunky, the Bowfighter was a complete workhorse. With the forward-placed engines, the plane's overall ruggedness and versatility, and its four cannons, occasionally acting as protective skids, became a strength rather than a weakness, eventually helping win the pilots over. According to a veteran pilot, quote, I've seen a bow go through a copse of trees, through the earthwork surrounding an ammunition hut, through the brick-built hut, and finished up literally just an armored box, with the pilot sustaining only a broken leg and his observer uninjured. On one of the most audacious operations in World War II, a bowfighter from RAF No. 236 Squadron, piloted by Flight Lieutenant A.K. Ken Gatward, with Sergeant G. Fern as his observer, the duo performed a low-level daylight operation on June 12, 1942, dropping a French tricolor flag right on top of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, in occupied France. Soon after, the bowfighter began service overseas as the war expanded through Europe and beyond. In the North African and Mediterranean theaters, the Bristol bowfighter demonstrated its extreme versatility, entering service in 1941 to take on various roles. On land, the bowfighter excelled in aiding the British Eighth Army, most notably in the Second Battle of El Alamein in late 1942. There, the aircraft took on duties from reconnaissance to ground strafing and bombing enemy installations. Its vital role helped achieve an Allied victory by decimating enemy positions and paving the way for infantry. The bowfighter also played a key role in safeguarding crucial convoys to Tobruk and Malta, executing anti-submarine patrols over Royal Navy vessels in the Mediterranean Sea. As the aircraft evolved, modifications and variants also came into play. Over time, engineers restructured its tail and issued guidelines to counter the plane's swing during takeoff. Later versions adapted to the readily available inline Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Subsequent rocket projectiles added to the bowfighter's lethality. Some models were even retrofitted to carry torpedoes and bombs. With the capacity to slice small crafts in two and sink 800-ton vessels, observers claimed the bowfighter could unleash so much firepower that it seemed the aircraft, quote, halted in midair due to the recoil. The Bristol Bowfighter multi-role aircraft arrived in Asia and the Pacific in mid-1942. While the aircraft had already achieved success across the RAF, it was in Burma and the Dutch East Indies where the type truly won over any remaining doubters and cemented its reputation. In these environments, the aircraft and their operators once again demonstrated their effectiveness, battling over both tropical forests and expansive seas under severe weather conditions that often pose significant challenges to maintenance and logistics. In the Far East, the bowfighter became known as the Whispering Death because the quiet, fast, and low-flying model often caught the Japanese by surprise, giving them little time to respond. To counter this threat, the Japanese resorted to various tactics. One rudimentary method was stringing steel cables between two trees in the hope of snaring an Allied plane. However, such tactics had little impact as the Allies continued their attacks, further weakening the already overstretched Japanese supply lines. Simply put, its unrivaled mix of cannons and gunpowder, coupled with its rocket and torpedo capabilities, presented a challenge that the Japanese simply could not match or counter. In March 1943, 
the Bristol Bowfighter demonstrated its reliability again during the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, which took place in the southwestern Pacific Ocean near New Guinea. The battle focused on a Japanese convoy of eight transports and eight destroyers, protected by a hundred fighters. This convoy aimed to carry reinforcements to Leh, New Guinea, an area already under Allied aerial surveillance. To thwart the enemy's reinforcement efforts, the Allies, primarily the United States 5th Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force, targeted the convoy using various aircraft, including A-20 Havocs, B-17 Flying Fortresses, B-25 Mitchells, and Australian Bristol Bowfighters from No. 30 Squadron. Tasked with attacking and sinking enemy ships, the Bowfighters played a vital role in low-altitude strikes against the convoy. When the Japanese spotted these large fighters, they wrongly identified them as Bristol Beauforts torpedo planes. This crucial misstep led them to reposition their ships to present a smaller profile. Seizing this unexpected advantage, the Bowfighters unleashed their 20mm cannons in a strafing run that caught the Japanese completely off guard. This initial surprise attack paved the way for subsequent bombing runs and strafing assaults by other Allied aircraft, setting a large part of the Japanese convoy ablaze. War correspondent and filmmaker Damien Perrer captured the Bowfighter's role in the battle as he flew during the engagement, standing behind one of the pilots. His footage helped make the Bowfighter one of the most iconic aircraft in Australian service during the conflict. The battle had a catastrophic outcome for the Japanese. Of the nearly 6,900 troops involved, only about 1,200 reached their destination, while the majority of their convoy was destroyed. This resulted in the loss of approximately 2,890 soldiers and sailors. Even General Douglas MacArthur lauded the battle as one of the most decisive and successful engagements of all time, forcing the Japanese into a defensive position for the rest of the war. On June 15, 1944, just days after D-Day, over three dozen Bristol bows, including nine bristling with potent torpedoes, soared from Langham, England. These planes rendezvoused with nine North American P-51 Mustangs, providing fighter cover. They'd just gotten word. Two large enemy ships and 17 escorts were about to set sail from Don Helda, north of Amsterdam. The first wave of bows unleashed their rockets and cannons, sending the ship's gunners scrambling for cover. Following this, the nine torpedo-laden bowfighters, nicknamed Torblows, swooped in to deliver one final coup de grace. As the smoke cleared, the tally for the Allies came in. They had sunk two merchant ships and one escort while damaging ten more. Miraculously, all aircraft made it back. The Bowfighters stayed in the fight until the very last minute of the war. In May 1945, with Germany teetering on the edge of surrender, these aircraft undertook what's often cited as the final military mission of the European theater, striking German naval assets in the Skagerrak Strait between Norway and Denmark. On September 21st, the last Bowfighter exited the Bristol Aeroplane Company's assembly line. By then, a staggering 5,562 of these versatile planes had been built. Originally a product of hasty improvisation, the Bristol Bowfighter became an Allied staple, serving in every major theater of the war. The mighty Bow's legacy endured post-war, gracing the skies for various nations, from Israel and Turkey to Portugal and the Dominican Republic, until 1960.